So we have uh, four presenters here today. Um, first up will be Michael Taylor from uh, Transport and Main Roads in Queensland, followed by Peter Newland from Planet Arc Power, then James Gard with Even Energy, and um, John Ravlak, Ravlak, sorry, from Munico will be um, will be an audio transmission. John is stuck somewhere between Kalgoorlie and Perth. Um, I believe he's probably mining some uh, lithium. He tells me that's the new gold out there. Well, I'd just like to give you a quick um, overview of what we're up to. So local buyer putting together a new arrangement in uh, 2023, green energy plus EV infrastructure. And it's going to cover off on solar, wind, pumped hydro, landfill gases, battery storage, and uh, all of these leading to EV charges, both AC and DC charges. Um, and both of those are primarily, it'll be primarily focused, of course, on our, our local government and not-for-profit um, clients. And we're covering around the supply of equipment, the planning, design, project management, construction, build, the operation, maintenance, call out and repairs, and the big bespoke packages uh, that you that councils will be able to, to look at and buy, which could be any one of the above or, or all of them, depending on the needs. So first up, Michael Taylor from the Department of Transport and Main Roads. Michael, I'll leave you. I shall step into your presentation and let you speak from now. Sounds great. Thank you, Shane. And I'd just also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their connection to land, sea and the community. So I'm going to provide a presentation to uh, everyone online in terms of what the Queensland government is doing, uh, particularly in relation to the Queensland electric uh, vehicle strategy. Um, I can't see that screen though yet. Shane, or maybe I'm having difficulties at my end. You've got your challenge screen up. Um, okay, I don't have that screen, so I'll just say next slide. And uh, when we're when we're talking, so the transport sector is the second highest emitting sector in Queensland, producing approximately fourteen percent of Queensland total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, critically, light passenger and commercial vehicles currently contribute to nearly half of those emissions, which is why intervention in these modes is critical. Um, we need to take action now in order to curb emissions growth uh, before 2030 uh, and then reaching net zero by 2050. In doing so, meeting the government's commitments under the Queensland Climate Action Plan. There's a range of work across government uh, in relation to addressing climate change and Transport Main Roads is currently progressing a wide range of, of work in terms of reducing those uh, transport sector emissions, uh, particularly in relation to developing a zero net emissions for transport roadmap, the Queensland Zero Emission Vehicle Strategy and Action Plan, which I'll talk through today, and also the Queensland Electric Superhighway, which I'll touch on as well. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Shane. Yep, that's so, Bit of a state of play, as at 31 October 2022, there's nearly 14,000 uh, battery electric vehicles registered in Queensland. And we're still tracking mainly doubling uh, every 12 months, uh, year on year, although that pro that um, ratio will um, ease over time as the number continues to grow, it'll be harder to, to double. Sorry to jump in, Mike. Just going to um, highlight, we, we can't see any slides at the moment. Sorry, Shane. Sorry to, to jump in. Oh, okay. So it's everyone. Yeah. Let me, um, could be me. Could be me. How are we going there now? There we go. I've got it there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And we can jump to the next slide then. Thanks, Shane. 
Fantastic. So energy and transport sectors are two of the largest carbon emitting, emitting sectors in Queensland. Focusing on these sectors will maximise the reduction in greenhouse gases uh, and contribute towards achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So TMR partnered with the Department of Energy and Public Works uh, to develop the uh, on-screen zero emission vehicle strategy uh, and, you know, to ensure the integration of the network uh, is a critical feature of that. Um, it's the whole of government strategy, uh, rather than just looking at transport in isolation. Uh, and as such, this, this nature of this work intersects many different areas of um, alternative fuels, new and emerging clean technologies and local manufacturing opportunities uh, in ZEV industries. Thanks, Shane. It seems to be on auto uh, change, so sorry about that. Um, our strategy aims to remove barriers to enable all Queenslanders, communities and industries to access and benefit from zero emission vehicles over the next 10 years. We want to continue to support the uptake and development of zero emission vehicle technologies and also build industry and supply capability. We also want to strategically integrate ZEF technologies into the energy system and the built environment, continue to support renewable energy uh, and hydrogen industry development, uh, which is still pretty nascent at the moment and create sustainable, accessible and affordable zero emission vehicle economy. Um, that next slide, thanks. Um, so the targets within the ZEV strategy are quite ambitious. Um, the strategy is public available too, and I'll provide a link to the strategy at the end. Um, we're looking at new zero emission vehicle passenger sales, such as 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2036. And QFleet has also got some challenging targets in terms of transitioning 100% of passenger vehicles by 2026. Um, we can roll on to that next slide, Shane. So one of the problems is um, the reducing emissions challenge is complex uh, and costly and a long-term process requiring significant investment just to stabilise emissions before transport emissions can be actually reduced uh, into the future. It requires a multifaceted and holistic approach uh, and, and will include governments, industry and public involvement and investment. The ZEV strategy outlines how we will shift to a zero emission future across five key priority areas on screen. Um, a key driver to reducing emissions includes increasing the proportion of zero emission vehicles across all transport modes and sectors. Our strategy principles seek to encourage greater uptake of zero emission vehicles and remove those barriers. They're designed to provide beneficial outcomes for Queenslanders uh, who remain front in mind as part of this strategy. Um, and we can roll on to the next slide, Shane. Thank you. So the under the uh, ZEV strategy, there's a two-year action plan which supports 20 initiatives across five priority areas, as I mentioned before, to accelerate the transition to ZEVs, working in partnerships with stakeholders across the state and Australia. Um, those progressive short-term action plans will enable us to continue to refine and improve our policies in this changing landscape over the next 10 years. And that'll include such things as revising or adding targets that I spoke to before and looking at um, new ones as the technology mat matures and incorporate learnings from previous action plans and involving customer needs across Queensland. Um, so one of the, if we can just go back to that last one, sorry. Um, one of the key initiatives under the scheme is a zero emission vehicle rebate scheme. Um, a cost it was a major barrier to uh, entry uh, and the Queensland government's offering $3,000 rebates for that should say eligible vehicles purchased from 16 March. Um, in terms of stimulating uptake, uh, the scheme targets light and passenger vehicles, as I mentioned before, which are the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Queensland's transport sector. Um, and that program will run for three years, providing approximately 15,000 rebates uh, on, a, on Queensland roads. Uh, and the scheme has, has commenced this year on 1 July. Um, and importantly, both individuals and businesses can access that scheme. Businesses are limited to five vehicles per year and, and individuals one vehicle per year. 
Um, so supporting infrastructure is also a key barrier. So not only range anxiety is an issue when you're creeping into an area where actual accessibility and availability uh, is now also a major concern for um, people with electric vehicles. So the Queensland government has an extensive fast charging network uh, as seen on screen here. The green ones are currently under phase three and, and rolling out uh, across the next six months to mid, mid June. Some of those are online now. Um, um, and looking to really broaden that network, as you can see, from the north um, and east coast into western and regional Queensland. Uh, and that cash is really um, enabling Queenslanders to be connected and providing the opportunity for everyone to be part of this transition uh, in that space. And again, contributing to emissions reduction through its use. Thanks, Shane. Similar to the rebate scheme, there's a $10 million co-fund public charging infrastructure scheme uh, under the ZEV strategy, uh, which will address range anxiety and the perceived lack of public charging infrastructure. Uh, it's proved really popular to date, which is really good. So the investment uh, we'll be looking to turn $10 million of Queensland government uh, funding uh, into at least 20 or potentially even $30 million of additional public charging fast infrastructure across Queensland. Um, that'll again provide greater competition uh, in the market uh, with third parties uh, entering the market there. So um, that's a really good outcomes that scheme will be known uh, next year. Uh, I do have a video to support the broader charging infrastructure scheme. I can't hear any down, Shane, but um, I'm not sure if there's anything you do about that. Yeah, there's sound playing at my end. Thanks, Shane. Um, so the overall objectives of the scheme, as I mentioned, address those issues around RAIN's anxiety and accessibility, uh, future-proof uh, the grid in terms of ensuring fast charging capability. Um, we've consulted with Department of Energy and Public Works in terms to ensure um, energy and network capability at the potential locations. Um, and also, um, Eventually, um, you know, we're looking to encourage greater uptake into the into the um, charging environment, which will be uh, beneficial for EV customers uh, in terms of providing better um, charging uh, costs uh, and and um, locations across Queensland. So looking forward um, in terms of strategy implementation considerations, obviously EV prices are, are a real sticking point at the moment and we've seen them actually continue to increase uh, rather than uh, decrease, which was uh, um, you know, broadly anticipated. Obviously there's market supply issues. Uh, which, you know, we're not alone in facing those challenges uh, with, you know, waits of up to at least six months, potentially more for other cars. Uh, but globally, there just isn't enough cars uh, for the demand uh, being able to produce um, to match the, uh, sorry, enough supply to match the demand. So we continue to monitor the sales of EV trends um, to look at our policy settings. Um, we've also seen secondhand EVs um, such as Teslas, I think selling at higher prices than the new ones, such as the supply issues. We've got the microprocessor chip shortages as well. Uh, prices of commodities such as lithium are at all time highs as well. And, and we've even got those OEMs considering buying mines directly. Um, petrol prices are at all time highs as well. All this is impacting on, I guess, um, future policy settings and current ones, particularly in relation to the rebate scheme. So we're monitoring these and, and we'll look to adjust these to align with the sort of the market that everyone's facing. But obviously being such a small um, market, it's, it's challenging. Um, we've seen some good things happen at a, at a national level, which is really good. So the Commonwealth's 
uh, committed to developing a national EV uh, strategy, which is um, really good from a state perspective. And, and we've seen other jurisdictions who have come to the table as well with um, respective strategies and, and incentives similar to what we've got in Queensland. Additionally, we've got the Olympics on the radar as well, uh, which is going to provide some major policy and infrastructure projects, uh, which will align with the broader emission reduction uh, goals and renewable energy targets that the Queensland government has, which is really good, and, and an opportunity to use that infrastructure investment programs, I guess, to accelerate uh, existing or new programs, which have those mutually beneficial outcomes in terms of the Olympic requirements and also the Queensland government requirements. And public transport for the Games will be a particularly important consideration with, with the target sort of being 100% electric. And I think that's the end of the presentation. Shane, I wasn't sure if you wanted to do Q&As now or at the end, but I'll... Um, yeah, I'll we might, do, that we might hold the Q&As off to the end. Um, yeah. If you're able to, to uh, stay around, Michael, or pop back yeah. in later. Yeah, that's, I'll just stay online just in case there's any technical difficulties logging back in. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. No worries. That. Thanks, Michael, for that. No worries. Next up, we've got uh, Peter Newland from uh, Planet Art Power, um, and he'll be speaking about the Alexis um, system. So, Peter, over to you, mate. Okay, you can go straight to the next slide if you like. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, quite a number of topics today in relation to things to watch out for in relation to EV infrastructure, as well as some of the solutions we're providing already to customers in South Australia, which we're looking to uh, replicate here in Queensland. The first thing I'd like to say, though, is when you think of all the electricity that is shipped through the Australian power grid today, if we actually convert all vehicles over to being electric, that would be more than all the energy shipped through the grid today. Right. So uh, some of the new things I'll talk about today are the electricity grid concerns and um, and how we're trying to deal with that and do do that in a smart way. So and this, that particular issue is something that's being um, you know, it's forefront of everyone in Europe at the moment in the UK, because they're well down the path of trying to put this infrastructure in place. And most of the hurdles that they're actually coming up against are, are about network connections and capacity on networks to handle charging. So I'll talk about those things today. Next one, Shane. So I'll go through some of the issues, why charging is needed, what our solutions are, and some of the things councils could consider moving forward. So next slide, Shane. So that, that curve that's up there that you see on that residential load profile, that is what an, a typical electricity usage looks like in most distribution areas in Queensland. And you can see in the evenings that you know, it gets quite high in the afternoon. That's when people come home and they, you know, they put on the air conditioning, they do their cooking, et cetera. It's at that top end that distribution networks are built to handle that capacity. Um, now, when you think of how a lot of EV charging is going to happen, there will be EV charging that happens in destinations and uh, you know, people's work, et cetera, shopping centres, parks, uh, et cetera. But there'll also be a lot of people that will actually charge at home. And that's actually going to actually increase that amount of um, um, peak demand, they call it, that networks have to manage, which will in turn actually increase costs. So what, what we do with our solutions is we actually bundle batteries with all of our EV solutions, which means we can, there's a section underneath there, we can unlock the existing latent capacity on a network so that we don't actually face those particular problems. So our solutions that we put out are, face, are based on First of all, getting EV infrastructure out there and being ahead of the uptake that's coming, but also making sure that we can grow that in the future and we don't have any impacts for Energy Queensland moving forward. Next slide, Shane. So when, when people actually connect um, uh, fast EV charges, in particular the DC ones to the grid, there's, there's, a file, there's about seven major problems that actually occur from a on a distribution network. And our technology actually addresses both all seven of those issues that actually uh, that actually arise. And so our technology is actually called Alexis, um, and it fixes the technology solution at the at the front end. The first three items being being about voltage management and disturbances on the power grid. Plus, it also uh, you can bolt a battery to it to manage all the capacity and manage demand and all the growth that's going to happen with EVs going forward. Uh, just hang on a second, Shane. So. What, we're, what we try and do with all of our sites is we try and make sure that we have no impact on the grid and we're not going to have those problems going forward. 
We back it all with a battery um, you know, to mitigate uh, demand and, uh, and put some stability into the site. But also we do this so that we can make revenue on day one and we support the grid. So it's not just about EVs here. We're actually putting in infrastructure that can support the national market as well. Um, so that's another, one of the reasons why we bundle things with batteries. And then the lastly is because we bundle it with batteries, it's much easier to invest in from an asset fund perspective because they're seeing revenue on day one as opposed to waiting for cars to come into the future uh, for that volume of infrastructure. Next slide, Shane. Okay, so there's a couple of other things and, I, and I'm not trying to uh, point fingers here or anything like this because this is a consistent issue um, everywhere around the world. But quite often people get to charging stations and they're not working and they're, not, and they're, um, they're actually broken. Now, at the current stage, you, know, you really can't afford that because um, there, there's a limited number of charging positions around. And so what we should be looking at when we put infrastructure in place is to make sure there's multiple charges um, available at each site. And we should also ask, be asking providers to carry more spare parts, warehouse things locally and have locally trained teams to respond to these. Because typically most of these charges are sourced from, um, from international sources, which means with the supply chain issues um, that Mike was talking about before, actually getting these fixed in a timely manner is going to be hard. Um, so we should be trying to find uh, providers that can also provide local spare parts and warehouse materials here to get them fixed when they fail. Um, and then the, we, should, we should also look to having, you know, at least an AC as a backup or a multi-charger to a DC site that's in place, which may give the customer enough power to get to the next town or whatever to actually fill their, fill their battery up, okay? Next slide, Shane. So... There's another, another couple of things that are really uh, quite difficult with EV. And uh, first of all, that's parking. Finding parking spots that actually have um, EV charging on them is hard. But also, when you look across, this is a survey that NRMA did for all customers um, that they have. And you, know, you can see that parking is, is challenging enough now for ICE customers and, and at the right price, right? And how you actually book and find spaces. You then think, well, if, you know, for instance, next year, the population of cars could be 12% of all EVs bought. How do we actually accommodate charging facilities in areas where there already is parking, right? Um, then on the other side of the coin, you also have areas where parking is also a problem. So, for instance, in uh, you know, urban environments where you have lots of townhouses and units, predominantly most of those customers actually park on the street because they don't have garage capacity. So we need to be able to look at how we provide on-street parking as a destination being their home in that particular area, or using a local combined facility that's in that community, which may actually be a park, which might be around the corner. So there's lots of things that councils have options here in, in, enabling, um, in enabling EVs. Uh, and there's lots of facilities that councils actually have too, that they could actually make available to the public and if we think about the infrastructure that we put there, if we put multi-purpose assets in place that solve more than one issue, then that's a great thing from a council's perspective and what they do for their constituents. Um, one on the bottom point there on the right-hand side, uh, we're doing some proposals now in South Australia with a couple of towns there. It's about putting EV infrastructure across all of the tourist locations that are, that are in that particular town. And the reason why we're doing that is to try and draw the customers off the highway from the main charging stations that the petrol stations may own and to encourage them to spend money in the local town and the local community where they're actually um, spending time, you know, which may be doing things like you know, whale watching, going to the reefs, et cetera. So trying to co-locate things um, is, a, is a good thing. Next one slide. Keep going there, Shane, sorry. So, you know, when you, when you think about the population of vehicles that are sold today, which Mike was talking about before, I mean, there's, you know, when you look at in, in the scheme of things, it's not a lot of vehicles, you know, so 3.39% of all cars were EV as of um, October this year. Now, the federal government policies that they've recently put in place have, in a way, already been introduced in other countries around the world. And what they saw in those countries was a massive jump uh, in EV adoption from 3% to say numbers around 12% within 12 months. 
Um, and so what that means is, okay, yes, people are buying lots more cars, but it's also, then you've got to think, how do we get into, how do we make sure enough EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure is ahead of the game so that we don't create um, public issues, social license issues moving forward uh, with customers that have EVs. So today, as an example, we've got, you know, just three and a half thousand uh, public fast chargers across, um, across Australia. Now, you know, McKinsey's are looking at this, you know, McKinsey's consulting firm, and they're saying by 2030, Australia could have 3 million EVs on the road. And that's going to need something like 2.8 million charging points. Now, those charging points are fast charges, slow charges, things in people's homes to actually connect overnight, et cetera. But it goes to show this rapid growth that we have ahead of us to get us to the 2030 targets, which align to the strategy that, again, Mike was referring to earlier from a Queensland government perspective. So there's a huge amount of charging that's needed. And, you know, like all things with customers, it's not a one size fits all model for customers, which I'll talk about a bit later on. Um, next one, next one down. So what, you know, we, we actually deliver solutions at the moment. We call them uh, a couple of different things. Destination charging is where someone goes to work or someone actually drives to a shopping center. So they might work at a warehouse or go and visit their local Ikea store. We actually put in fast charging infrastructure at those places and we call that destination charging. And I will give you an example of that model in the next couple of slides. The one in the middle is called community charging. Um, and so this could be, you know, in, in lots of different council locations. It could be at water board locations. It could be um, churches, schools, parks, et cetera sporting facilities. There's a whole heap of things that you could put community charging on. Um, and then there's also home street charging. Now, one of the issues I think we're going to face is, as I mentioned before, is how do we get ahead of the curve on all of this? Um, it was just recently I was driving through Mansfield and Mount Bravat here in Brisbane, and there were, there were leads, power leads running out of the car, up over the footpath, into a second story bedroom window in a townhouse to actually charge his car out of the wall. Um, you know, obviously he's trying to do the right thing there for himself, but that actually creates a safety issue for people walking down the street. And there's a lot, of, you know, he's probably broken another three or five rules as well in doing that. But it just goes to show that we need to be ahead of the game uh, so that we don't actually create other problems for ourselves. So EV charging demand is actually going to be in lots of different places. It'll be in homes, retail outlets, community facilities, precincts, manufacturing highways, holiday destinations. So it's not just highways we've got to deal with. It's where people travel every day with vehicles. Um, the other thing is it's not just pure electric vehicles. It's also plug-in electric vehicles. There's a team of people I know in Sydney that they drive a, I mean, this is not an ad, but they drive a Mitsubishi Outlander. It actually has enough capacity just, just to drive electric to get them to and from work. That means they're actually in electric mode over the whole year. They're in 97% mode for electricity. Um, so that means they're actually charging every day. Whereas other colleagues that are like at work here that have like, a, for instance, a Tesla, they may only have to charge once a week uh, because their battery is actually longer in doing those same types of journeys. Next slide, thanks, Shane. And again. So here's an example of a charging site that um, has gone through financial close. It's, it's in um, detailed design now, and it, it's actually being implemented in a shopping center in Adelaide in the new year. So the picture down the bottom right there, you see um, six orange, orangey gray boxes. They're the batteries that we put in place. Then we have all of the charging, is a lot of the charging infrastructure inside that container that's there, the big long gray one. And then we have a combination of AC and DC fast charges underneath those canopies that are there. So in this case, we're putting in a one megawatt battery. We're putting in six DC charges and eight AC charges. And, you know, you look at this and go, you know, that's a lot of infrastructure to put in on, on day one and are enough cars going to come along? Uh, but what we've done here with the, the shopping centre was very keen to do a couple of things. One is make sure you know, they're, they're ready for the EV uptake that's going to happen in Adelaide and, uh, and um, uh, ACT is a little bit ahead, further ahead on adoption rates than here. Um, so they wanted to have some facilities for customers and they wanted the ability to be able to grow that infrastructure as EVs came along, hence the battery in this case. The battery also enables this to actually make revenue on day one 
which means we overcome the chicken and egg problem from a investment in EV infrastructure. Um, so there's no point really putting in four fast charges somewhere today because it won't probably make 100% of its revenue to a year four or five once adoption comes along. The other thing we did here, which could also be of interest to lots of other customers, is we put in this function called EV Boost. So again, the shopping centre was worried that just the Uber drivers are going to come and park there, have their lunch, and move on and not spend it go sorry one up Shane and not spend any money in the shops so in this case we introduced a loyalty program with um, the shopping center and e in this EV boost function the customers tap on when they get there like normal and they get a very slow rate of charge when they actually go into a shop and start spending some money uh, they tap on again and it actually goes to a fast charge once once they're inside the shopping center's doors so uh, we can do, and, and their customers actually get a cheaper rate of charge than somebody else that just pulls up at the triple charge. So again, it's a, it's a multi-purpose asset. It makes money on day one and enables us to put in larger infrastructure um, on day one and not face the issues that are currently in place in the UK and Europe at the moment. Next slide, Shane. So yeah, so the solution that we're, we're talking about, you know, it, it, it does a number of things. The first one is it reduces the connection complexity and issues with the uh, electricity networks. Number two, it makes revenue on day one because it's all it's not only helping EVs, but it's also helping the power grid and the Australian energy market operator manage the grid. Uh, number three, it enables revenue streams in the future to come along by supporting the power grid, uh, which is you know which is a really important thing to remember. Um, number four. Um, we actually manage the whole site load and the batteries to make sure that the network isn't impacted as part of our control system. And we actually pay, we actually share the revenue that comes out of these sites or, um, or pay leasing money to the uh, landowners um, as part of this particular model. But this infrastructure is actually provided free upfront. So there's no upfront costs for any of the customers here. Um, and the last, last one is near and dear to my heart, number six is that because we're putting a battery in place there, and if we do this in local communities like sporting facilities, like uh, you know, netball fields for the girls on the weekend or the football club for the boys, um, we can actually put a battery and charges in there. And that means when we have the battery, it's charging, it's charging itself up to get ready to support the, um, the electric vehicles. It's actually enabling the local community there to put on more solar onto the homes that are in that local community and not create any issues for the Energex assets that are in place or urban assets. Next one, Shane. And one last one. So, you know, what, what we try and do is when we think of infrastructure, we think of it not just about, you know, charging a car. So, you know, we, we look at this, you know, there's small businesses, there's lots of small businesses that will be moving to electric vehicles um, sooner than everyone thinks. And so as an example, there's, there's already a company in Brisbane that leases cars to Uber drivers, electric cars to Uber drivers, so that they don't have an upfront capital cost and they've just got a weekly OPEX charge. And so they're already starting to drive in and around Brisbane, right? Um, there'll be local tradesmen with their utes and so forth that come into play. So for instance, in the US now, you have the Ford F-150 Lightning. It's a F-150 truck. Looks and feels the same, purely electric. People can build houses and uh, with just the electric power from the truck without actually needing anything else on site. So there'll be local tradespeople. And then also when we've got local courier drivers, the major supermarkets are already looking and investigating converting their fleets to electric delivery trucks. Um, so there'll be lots of lots of little businesses that will have electric vehicles. On the right hand side, we've got the community charging components when it comes to you know tourist locations, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's about convenient spots where customers go. Uh, and so that's you know, how can we underpin that um, with uh, council facilities or indeed uh, also to support council EV fleets moving forward. The solar soak is what distribution networks refer to. There's too much solar on the grid. I need it to go somewhere. And so rather than turning everyone's solar system off, if we bundle these things with batteries, we can soak up all that solar and make it useful for EVs in the future. And then the other ones on the left-hand side in orange about grid support, the services we provide through this model also support the grid, which means it's making more than rev more revenue than just selling um, energy to the car. And last one, Shane now. 
So there's, some, there's definitely some considerations we need to um, think about when we put in EV infrastructure. And again, uh, uh, Mike from Transport actually mentioned some of this already. So at the moment, there's limited suppliers and investors uh, looking at this, and they are all experiencing extended lead times for equipment. Now, when we think about what happens when you buy equipment, if you buy equipment in bulk, you know, large volumes, you're actually able to secure some of those supply chains more easily than just buying two, three or four or five um, in small bundles. So we need to consider how we're going to actually um, do that. Uh, Shane indicated before that, you know, local buyers actually looking to put sort of like a panel arrangement in place to buy these particular things off and setting together some working partnerships with all types of resources that are needed to deliver these types of infrastructures from multiple different types of providers. Um, the third point is any provider just like us is also going to be looking for long term leases on um, on pieces of land. So, you know, not one year, two years, three years, but 10 and 10 plus or play be 10 plus 10. Um, so that, that, that'll all have to be things that we consider. Now, as part of that Queensland uh, public infrastructure rollout of EV that's um, currently underway, uh, we had a chat to the um, state minister the other day and a couple of ministers and they to see what would have to happen from a council perspective to actually enable a site um, to be used for, um, for that particular program. And uh, we brought to their attention, there's a number of planning, planning issues and planning rules that prohibit the council to sort of um, proceed down that path unless they go through a proper tender and uh, planning development program. But what the ministers have agreed that if, if someone comes to you guys and wants to work with you to secure a site for the public uh, EV process, then you can we can easily extend, they can give you a form and then the state minister will exclude that site from the standard procurement development process, okay? Um, and the last thing is, is we all get it, we, or everyone is involved on this call with development of new new subdivisions, new developments all across the state. We need to think about how we can put this infrastructure in on day one, as opposed to retrofitting it in the future. So retrofitting it and putting it in already developed areas, which we refer to as brownfields, is always more expensive than doing it as a greenfield site up front. So we, you know, we could think about, is there space, pieces of land that really can't be used for a house block, such as the picture that I've shown you on the screen here, that could be turned into some EV infrastructure in those particular areas. Um, just on that, that picture that's there, that, that corner block there was actually just a garden bed before that. And so, you know, we work with the, um, the um, shopping centre owner to actually uh, work and try and fit this into that space. But there's always like these little pieces of land that are available for these types of things in the future. Um, that's it for me, Shane. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate that. And um, so we might move on to James Gard from Even Energy. And James, um, it's over to you, mate. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you so much uh, for Peter and Mike for the presentations before. They were they were great. Um, hopefully, I can add a little bit to value to everyone on the call as well. Um, I'm from a company called Even Energy, and essentially, we uh, specialise in fleet transition planning. So in the space of converting your fleet to electric vehicles, there's a lot of considerations that you need to make. Um, we have worked with state, local governments, um, private organisations to help develop these quite robust plans for transition. As the fleet complexity or size you know, increases, the, the challenge in front of you becomes you know, infinitely more complex. If you're sort of moving in one or two vehicles into a fleet, it's not particularly hard, but what we do is we try and address how to convert those larger fleets and put a framework in place that makes it easy for, for all stakeholders involved. Now, in an effort to help make this transition more accessible for everybody, we've actually developed a, a free online web tool, uh, which has received some, uh, we received some state funding uh, to help develop this, which sort of ties into our larger uh, premium uh, software. But We've got a vehicle calculator uh, or comparison, which is called uh, Better Fleet, which gives you the option to sort of run comparisons and get total cost of ownerships and emissions profiles of 
EVs versus uh, your ICE vehicles. So you can start to run some of those sensitivity analyses yourself and get an understanding of what your business case would look like. So throughout this presentation, we actually go through our methodology of how we would do a fleet transition plan, the steps and considerations that we would look at. And uh, I believe at the end of this, Shane will um, distribute the, the slides that everybody's had. So please feel free to you know, look through the steps that we've outlined. We've you know, tried to do it in earnest and we haven't um, omitted any of our secret sauce. Um, so given enough time and, and you know, attention to detail, you would be able to do a very similar thing to what we do. So um, Shane, I'll get you to jump to the next one, please. So when it comes into to doing a fleet transition plan, the first thing to really do is take half a step back and understand the, the who and why first. Um, more often than not, uh, a transition team will need to include sustainability managers, fleet managers, facility personnel, and you know, typically a, a key stakeholder. Some of these people are people that haven't previously need to be involved with fleet and procurement to this degree. There's going to be a lot of opinions and a lot of you know, needs and criteria that's thrown around. And unless all of these stakeholders come together and can abide by an agreed framework, these transition plans are not really going to you know, do anyone any good. So one of the first steps that we would always recommend is understand the who and why first. What are the targets? What are your milestones? And who is involved in this transition? We'll get to go next one, Shane. There's a lot of uh, key questions that fleet owners are going to be asking themselves, such as you know, vehicle selections, optimizing long-term costs, infrastructure, um, you know, how do you upgrade? What do you upgrade? I think that some of the other points that um, Peter was talking on before in terms of the infrastructure as well is a huge, huge part that comes into it. And we appreciate that it's a new landscape for a lot of people. And a lot of the times, you know, if you're in this space yourself, you may not even know what questions you have to ask. There's that certain unconscious, um, unconscious incompetence for it, where it's like, there's so much that we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. So understanding how to ask the right questions is a, a key first step in this transition process. I'll get to your next one, Shane. So what's the difference between a framework versus a, a plan? A, a plan is a single snapshot in time, and it can be great for identifying, you know, where we currently are in a, um, an intention moving forward. But the minute that there is a change in the, you know, the technology that's available, or we get some more um, uh, constraints with supply chain, for instance, that's where the best laid plan can sort of fall on its face. So it's important that we look at this and say, well, okay, we need to rethink our entire framework for procuring and managing electric vehicles. We've had an established process previously without that our fleet managers have you know, been able to do for you know, decades, but this whole process needs to be rethought and we need to consider everyone in the chain. I'll get you to go next for me. Thanks, Shane. So there's nine steps that we've identified and, and that we follow at Event Energy to create a fleet transition plan. And then this is our framework. So step one is we have to collect all of our data. Step two is we baseline our fleet. We then agree on some modeling assumptions because we don't know all of the pieces of information right now. We then establish some different scenarios that we would like to explore. And this is where the, the who, what, where, when, and you know, why really play an important role. We then run those modeling scenarios, integrate a little bit of change management because change is hard. Let's consider everyone and do some reviews. We then review our plan and get buy-in from all relevant stakeholders, present that plan to senior management or whoever may be involved. And then the iteration process can really begin. Once you've got this framework down, you're not going to get everything right the first time. So this is where you can come back, re-go through steps one to eight once again, and keep doing iterations. And some of the assumptions that you may have made in step three on your first attempt become known parameters further down. And this could be, say, um, availability of electric vehicles, costing, range, infrastructure upgrades. You may have to make a, a best guess for some of these. And out of energy, we definitely make an educated guess um, for, for some criteria, that's for sure. Um, I personally don't, the, the team 
with the, the PhDs are the ones that do that, but you can still definitely make those assumptions to begin that transition. I'll get you your next for me, Shane. So collecting data is incredibly important. And this is where the first step really comes in in terms of baselining your fleet. So what do you actually need to look at? A lot of times when we work with councils and, and you know, organizations, they say, all right, beautiful. I just need to know vehicle availability and price. Bam, we're good to go. Does the projected range meet the projected range of this particular vehicle? And unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. So we need to be able to identify the vehicle use case, the total cost of ownership, and then the gap analysis that we would be needing to, to do. We then have to look at charging requirements and how we would actually manage and integrate that within our depot. Because if we don't understand the vehicle use case, how are we going to understand the charging and infrastructure requirements? Then there's some other information that's going to be required to help roll out these changes through your organization. Now, given everyone's time, I, I'm not going to go through all of these in a, you know, a granular level. It's going to be an overview to the steps. And with this information, you'll be able to hopefully you know, work through it in your own time if it's of relevance to you. But this is just a, an, an understanding and an overview of all the steps. So we'll go next one, Shane. So the only thing better than electrifying a vehicle is getting rid of a vehicle altogether. If we can either do mode shift away from you know, individual transport and more towards public electric bus or you know, other forms of transport that are more environmentally friendly, or even just realize that we don't need all the infrastructure or, or equipment that we've currently got, that's going to be a better uh, outcome for your total cost of ownership and also the CO2 impact. So what we want to do is look at baselining our fleet, which has got things like our replacement timing, uh, vehicle utilization. So what subclasses of, of vehicles do we currently have within our fleet? Um, how much capital would that require? How much uh, operational expenditure would that require? And then what's the emissions profile of that particular fleet? You may find that you're wanting to do decarbonization and you've got a 50% you know, reduction over the next, say, five years. There may be a segment of your fleet, which is the heaviest form of, of emitters. And if you focus on that area first, you could achieve that target instead of focusing on you know, another area which may not be as, as fruitful. Um, once you've established that baseline, we can then run our sensitivity analyses or do our cost comparisons off this current number for your fleet. So we'll go next one, thanks Shane. Next, you have to agree on some modeling uh, assumptions, as I said earlier. So you're not going to know everything. This is where we might need to make some assumptions about what the price of petrol is going to be, uh, what the price of electricity is going to be, or even things like the resale value. You know, as we said before, or sorry, not, not we as um, I think it was Mike said before, the cost of a electric vehicle, particularly a Tesla, uh, now more expensive in the used market than a lot of the times they bought them brand new. And we do need to factor these things in. The used car market is going crazy at the moment, but in say the next five, 10 years, do we still expect diesel vehicles to hold a resale value that they're currently seeing? So while we can make an educated guess, the more iterations of this we're able to run, we can hone in and tighten those assumptions. Uh, I'll get you to go next for me, thanks Shane. And then what we want to do is we want to establish a couple of transition scenarios. And this isn't just saying, well, let's transition all of our fleet and go for gold. We need to get all of the stakeholders involved to agree on what we actually want to see, what's important to everybody, and then how can we model those scenarios. At of Energy, we will typically do four scenarios in our fleet transition plans. The first one is business as usual. So if you make no change to your current fleet, what do we expect BAU to be over the next 10 years in terms of CapEx, OpEx, emissions, so on and so forth? We would then look at doing a cost optimized scenario, which is usually what the finance teams they get involved really want to see. So how can we do this transition if the vehicles are at price parity? Now, this might include price parity for total cost of ownership, or it might just be price parity for the vehicle itself. A lot of the times, um, People are wanting to factor in things like infrastructure costs as well, or you know, other associated costs with the transition. 
this is where the agreement from everybody, what are we actually looking at? And then run that price parity. And we can see over a 10 year period, what we might be looking at for total cost of ownership. Um, another section we'll look at is say like a segmented approach. And this is what I said before of picking a particular depot or class of vehicle that you may wanna transition first. The ability to transition passenger vehicles is currently uh, more realistic than it is to transition all of your heavy vehicles. Doesn't mean you can't plan for them. But if you said you wanna transition 100% of your passenger vehicles in the next six years, what would that look like on your TCO instead of if you tried to transition all of them, for instance? And then lastly, we would usually model a leadership scenario, which is we're doing uh, this transition because we wanna see the decarbonization of the transport industry. And most people agree that there's going to have to be a little bit more cost involved to do that. You know, you pay for what you want to see. So if we increased our budget by X percent, how would we see that transition our, uh, accelerate our transition? So if we don't just look for price parity of vehicles, if you say, I'm happy to extend my budget an extra 20% to purchase slightly more expensive cars, what would that do to my transition timeline? And more often than not, you'll be able to see it accelerated by on average, we're seeing at the moment about four years. So once you've got all those scenarios and you've modeled them, you'll be able to help, you'll be able to start compiling them into a business case, basically, with the numbers that you've compiled from your baseline of your fleet and then doing your vehicle comparisons, which I believe is next. Thanks, Shane. Yep, and then model the, um, transition scenarios with your, your vehicles. So this is where once you've agreed on what you would actually like to see, you can choose specific vehicles. And this is actually a snapshot of the Better Fleet um, tool, which if you'll be getting the, the slides afterwards, this should have a link into it. But if for whatever reason, the link is gone, if you just Google, you know, Better Fleet vehicle comparison, it is a free resource online that you can jump in, select multiple vehicles, break it down by make, model, body type, uh, price, emissions, whatever you need to, and then start to generate some, some of them sensitive um, uh, total cost of ownership scenarios and also adjust various sensitivities in the calculations. I'll get you to go next for me, Shane. So now you've got your sensitivity analysis. You can then break it down by total cost of ownership of years owned, kilometers driven, uh, fuel price, emissions, and you can start to compile these into really easy to read, easy to digest graphs. And this is essentially what's gonna form the basis of your various business propositions. So you could say, if we transitioned this particular type of vehicle with this particular type of vehicle, we can see that the total cost of ownership will come down over 10 years. But that total cost of ownership will only reach parity at year five. And then as we go from year five and beyond, we'll see it turn positive. And that's what those um, stat graphs up in the, uh, the right side image up in the top left, those are sort of stack graphs of uh, total cost of ownership breakdown, whether it's um, vehicle capital, OPEX, maintenance, uh, fuel, so on and so forth. It's broken down there. So you can really use this tool to help create the foundation of your own business cases. We'll get you to go next for me, Shane. And then this is probably the bit that's the most relevant to, to a lot of people at the moment, which is the, the charging infrastructure and how do you actually plan for it? So now that you've baselined your fleet, you've got an understanding of the types of vehicles that you would like to bring in. You've got an understanding of the type of use cases that they go through. You can start to make appropriate selections on the charging that you're looking at. If Energy would uh, advocate that your charging solution is sort of like a barbecue. Uh, the best is always going to be low and slow so that you're really not forcing up that peak demand um, or, or exceeding site capacity and then needing to force infrastructure upgrades. So here's a summary of the types of charges, but on the next slide, which I'll get you to go to Shane, is basically a flow chart which breaks down how you would make the appropriate charging decision with the goal being to have the lowest and slowest form of charging appropriate, I'm um, sorry, um, possible. So, this is, this is the logic that our team will use when we look at assessing um, charging solutions for depot locations. With uh, leasing agreements, I understand there's a lot of conversation at the moment around, you know, how do we 
bundle these packages and how do we reimburse staff members if they're wanting to you know charge the vehicles at home and that's a conversation that can be had with you know the hr team and the fleet management team in terms of can we track it with telematics devices can we look at reducing some fees associated with the leasing to make it more accessible um, but that is something that can be considered as well and that i believe is um, sort of the first option that we ask, you know, is the vehicle charged at a depot or private dwelling? So if it, yes, how can you meet your requirements and then flow through? If you can do it at the depot or if you can do it at your private dwelling, that's where it's up to the organisation to review its or, or council to review its um, its use policy and find uh, a solution that would work for, for all vehicle owners. We'll get you to go next for me, Shane. And then lastly, uh, we will be looking to model the data that we've seen. Uh, and this is how we would essentially show the feasibilities of various transition scenarios. So you can see things like your emissions versus your business as usual, total cost of ownership, so on and so forth. Um, I won't get into to too much detail about these at the moment. We'll probably just move on to the, to the last few slides. Doing uh, a bit of future proofing has been a really strong topic that we're seeing come through at the moment. Um, and this requires you to be doing the, you know, charging infrastructure review of your particular site, the vehicle usage review, and just making sure that we're not going to be running into any hurdles. If you know over the next 10 years, you're planning to bring in X amount of vehicles to your site, does your site currently have that capacity? Yes, no, maybe. Can we plan to either incorporate some sort of smart charging or battery solutions that we can uh, use to you know, negate the need for any grid upgrades? Or do we need to look at doing grid upgrades? Um, also the advent of things like uh, vehicle load or grid integration, as well as things like solar sponges or PV integration, are other things to consider, which um, Peter was talking about prior. Sorry, oh, Mike, sorry. Sorry, gentlemen. <laughs> I'll get you to go next for me. Thanks. And then lastly, change management. So when you're dealing with doing transitions of your fleet, it's also important to remember that a lot of people are going to be impacted by change. When change happens to you, it's often, um, you know, met with a lot of friction. A lot of times a little bit of anger is involved as well because people aren't involved in the decision-making process. And when change happens to you, it's not, it's not pleasant. But when you're a part of change and you're part of the process, it can be a lot more palatable and you can also feel empowered when doing it. So this is why the stakeholder engagement that we do at the beginning and understanding, you know, how do we get everybody involved to have these decisions and what are going to be the long flow on effects? It's, it's crucial because if you don't get buy-in from everybody, you'll see this fall, fall flat. Um, uptake will be relatively low, enthusiasm will be low and you can have a fantastic plan but unless it gets action, it's, it's going to be ultimately useless. So the table to the right outlines a couple of different areas within most organizations that would be looking to fleet transition, the level of impact if re retraining is appropriate, and then types of upskilling that may be required. And building that into your transition plan and having this part of the conversation is going to be a, an often overlooked, but key element to a successful transition. Here you go, next one, thanks Shane. Lastly, you can compile all of these findings into a set plan. And I believe the next slide was then just present this plan to management. Um, present your outcomes, get signed up from leadership, and then it's important to keep doing ongoing iterations following that similar structure. Um, this is the exact methodology that we use at Energy to create fleet transition plans. We are able to do a bit of automation through our software, um, which the better fleet is sort of the, the lighter version. We've got a full uh, version that we're able to use and offer to, to businesses and organizations and councils to help manage their fleet and help automate part of that transition process. Um, I believe contact details are in the slide if anyone would like to have a discussion about it. But this is mainly just how we go about doing a transition plan and things that we consider. Um, Looking over the insights uh, from our team, we, we asked them as well, you know, things that they would consider. Um, and this is just a snapshot of sentiments from within the delivery team of Avenergy. Um, I can, they're relatively small on, on screen. 
I won't force anyone to go through and read them now, but I'm also not going to read them all myself. Um, they'll be able to be distributed in the pack once it's once it's done. So just as I said, um, lastly, so better fleets complete fleet transition and management software. Um, if anyone would like a demonstration of how it works, you're more than welcome to reach out. Uh, details are in the slides that follow. But with the steps that we've outlined in this slide, um, or this slide presentation, you would actually be able to generate a fleet transition plan very similar to what of energy may be able to do. Um, the difference can come from uh, the you know, complexity and size of your fleet. That's where it does start to get a little bit hairy, but the fundamentals are, are all exactly the same. So I hope that you all found some value within in these points or continue to find some value with the slides after you've got them. Um, thank you, Shane, for organizing this and thanks for everyone for listening. Thank you, James. And uh, if, we've, yes, if there's any questions, you can either contact James or uh, Steve Lewis, who was unable to um, attend and present today. Um, our final speaker is um, actually has only got um, a video, not a video, sorry, an audio. And I'm not even sure that people are going to be able to hear it. So what I'm going to do is um, attempt to play it um, if somebody could um, indicate if you can hear it, we can't hear it or it's too faint. Um, we'll just um, send it as an attachment um, later on. So. Can people hear anything? Currently got nothing uh, on my end, Shane. Apologies that I'm unable to do this live. I'm currently in the transit to uh, in the goldfields on some way. Um, I'll um, it was a, just sort of stopped off there, Shane. It was a, a yeah. little, little bit distorted um, on on my end. Yeah, look, we might. Uh... We might um, give that a miss. Um, and um, John will send me the slides and um, we can add that to this presentation when we send it all out to everybody. So he's still talking, but we can't hear him. All right, so we might just jump into the Q&A um, session there. So. Um, I'm just going to um, look up there. Not clear enough. No, understand. All right. So, do we have some um, additional questions? You can either, um, if you wish to speak, let me know and I will. Um, I'll open up your. Um, Not looking like we got any questions yet. Okay, we actually got one here from Tanya. Um, Tanya is asking, what sort of data has been collected on the environmental impact of, uh, well, I'm guessing it's EVs and, uh, and charging and batteries. Somebody able to, um, respond back to there. I'm thinking either James or Peter might be best place there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in. I guess in terms of the environmental impact, there's a couple of different ways that you could approach this this question, Tanya. And for full disclosure, I'm not a subject matter expert. I do have a, you know, a, a good understanding of the space, but please forgive me if my answer is somewhat limited. It may be best to refer to Peter if he knows a bit better. Um, are you talking in terms of like life cycle emissions and, and that sort of uh, conversation? Yeah, okay, beautiful. So life cycle emissions is fortunately something that's gaining a lot more attention from, you know, uh, the wider audience or, or part of the conversation. For anyone that doesn't know, so life cycle emissions basically incorporates the impact of building or creating a vehicle or a battery um, and the emissions that are, are embedded in that vehicle itself. 
So it's probably no, um, uh, well, I mean, it, it actually it may be uh, news to some people that electric vehicles carry a larger carbon footprint to actually produce than a typical fossil fuel vehicle. So on the outset, if you just have those two vehicles sitting in front of you, it is uh, the electric vehicle, which is actually less environmentally friendly just from the offset. Now, this is where you talk about something called the wheel to well. So basically the, the production of that vehicle. It's from the use of electric vehicles and the incorporation of green energy that we start to see that emissions profile come down. If you're primarily using green energy for your vehicles, you'll start to see that, uh, that total impact, what we would call like, what we will call the life cycle emissions, reduce over time. So we would typically see a parity um, with average use on average vehicles after about four to five years. So, and, and I am speaking in very, very general terms and there's a lot of nuances that can be involved, but it's typically after about that four to five year period, you would start to see um, an electric vehicle become more environmentally friendly than your typical ICE vehicle. Now, that being said, uh, the use of green energy can impact that dramatic, dramatically, uh, dramatically, as well as the amount of driving that you do. So where you'll get back your emissions is from the, the tailpipe emissions. So if you've got a higher use vehicle, an EV will reach uh, positive emissions sooner. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, I've actually opened up, uh, I think, everybody's microphone, so um, feel free to um, speak. The other, the other thing I'd like to add, just on top of what James said, which is very true, James, by the way, it's a great, great answer, um, is that I know ourselves, we're, we're, we're Planet Ark Power, we're actually uh, related to Planet Ark Foundation as well, and the Planet Ark Foundation has is the pe people running the um, ACE hub, the circular economy hub for the Australian government. So, for instance, on our side of things, we have uh, have to adhere to the circular economy components. Is what we do, what we used to do with solar. Uh, so we go through recycling panels if we take them off roofs, so they go back into the supply chain aspects. And we'll be doing the same thing with uh, the batteries and the components that we use on all our charging stations as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to look, as James indicated, um, would you say well to wheel or cradle to grave, those types of scenarios in all of this, um, when you make those decisions, definitely agree. Thanks. We, we also got a question and it's pretty much around the same area from Tyler um, asking, with all of the new infrastructure and EV use, is there any development in the recovery and reuse space when the infrastructure and cars reach the end of their use? It's a very good question. I Actually, if you're in um, any capital city today, as soon as a Tesla car has an accident or something like that, you actually see a mad rush for parts out of that by people that retrofit their batteries and motors into existing cars. Um, so there's actually quite a quite a bit of recovery of a number of those minerals today already in, in vehicles. Uh, but secondly, there are also jurisdictions around the world where they have schemes in place, um, which could be done at a council level, where the batteries in those particular areas are actually reused or repurposed for things like grid storage batteries or for people's batteries at homes and the like. Um, so some, some jurisdictions are very, very good about putting in rules, which is related to the circular economy about reusing that existing asset. Um, and that is something that we should actually consider from a Queensland perspective, definitely. Peter, <clears throat> Michael here from TMR, just further to add to that. So Queensland's also developing a uh, battery industry strategy as well. Uh, and part of that will look at um, ensuring the circular economy continues as part of the EV uptake. Um, and also people are looking at retrofitting existing vehicles as well. So with the supply shortage issue, people are actually um, looking at retrofitting existing vehicles to be electric vehicles um, as a sort of um, temporary fix before a full transition as well. Yeah. Just to, to provide some numbers on that. So I, I believe the, the, the guidance is around um, so to take Tesla, for instance, battery warranty is about that seven-year mark. 
Um, after that, they would sort of deem it as no longer fit for purpose for a road vehicle, but it would still be able to then gain a second life as that battery storage for, say, a home, for instance. So you would be able to take that battery. Uh, you wouldn't need to go through the recycling process, just the repurposing. So while it might not be suitable for a car, there are other, industry, other industries that would be able to, to benefit from that same battery. Um, you can get, you know, quite a few decades out of the life of a battery if proper health guidelines are adhered to um, while, before needing to sort of break down and, and reuse the raw materials. Thanks for that, gentlemen. Um, and I'm also aware there is a, uh, a battery recycler being um, setting up facilities south of Brisbane. Um, to help work on that, that recycling the batteries out of existing either damaged vehicles that are written off or, uh, or, or units that have been replaced um, for, uh, from the manufacturers. So there are things to do. Do you want me to take the next question? Oh, I, I, there's a question there about, do people have to spend money in the shops to have their car charged? Um, they, as I was said before, when they connect up, they'll actually get a slow rate of charge to their vehicle. So they can actually get some charging in this particular case. Once they go inside and spend some money in the, well, move into the shopping center, they just tap on again at the doors of the shopping center and it goes to a full rate of charge. Now, that model was something that that particular shopping center wanted to implement. There'll be other asset owners that we're dealing with now that just say, look, you know, whoever uses the charging station, they actually get to charge at the rate normal that they want. But each, uh, this particular customer wanted that solution in place. Um, so you, you, it can be done in multiple ways and all of that's programmable in the control system. Excellent. And look, just from a, a user experience over the last like five and a half years for myself, um, naturally you tend to, gravitate towards um, shopping centres or, or places that have got EV charges um, and you end up spending money even if there was no charge at the EV charging station because whether you're going to be there for you know 10 minutes or an hour or two hours, um, most people are not going to sit in their car. They're going to go in, maybe do some copy, maybe do their weekly shopping or some other sort of shopping. So um, the centres are... Um, are making some money from you, whether it's free charging or or at a charged rate, regardless. So, um, In, uh, those are ahead of the curve have been have been attracting you know the small numbers of EV drivers um, already. Um, but I do notice there's a lot more monitorising their EV charges out there now than um, probably five years ago, where there was a lot of um, free no cost charges out there yeah what, what i'd also say from a highway charging perspective what, what what i've certainly noticed when i was in the uk working that um the people putting in highway infrastructure are actually putting in a whole experience process for those customers you know coffee shops food outlets um swings for the kids you know da da da, -da to try and um, so the customers actually take, you know, first of all, take some time out and chill from the driving experience, which is, you know, tiring and from a safety perspective is a good thing. But also whilst they're there for their, you know, 20 minutes fast charging, there's, there's actually things to do. And they're actually doing things now competitively to try and encourage more people to their sites. So that's from a highway perspective, but certainly from a community perspective, you know, from my side of things, it'd be great to get people to come off the highway and, and spend time in town, spend money in town, see the local town while they're charging. And um, that's why I think, you know, where you put assets, you know, from a council perspective should also be in places where, you, you know, they, the customers have um, some things to see or do in that particular town and actually get to Shane's point, spend a little bit of money in town as opposed to just driving by them and not spending any money in the local community. Thanks, Peter. Have we got any more questions? Okay. What about power outages and when power providers have to fix infrastructure? So yeah. it'll end up for safety reasons, et cetera. So. Yeah. Look, it's a good question. Um, so in some of our solutions, the battery actually provides the backup power um, in proposals that we've already put in place. 
so people could still come in and charge on on off the battery in other cases we're suggesting to councils the same ev charging infrastructure that i described before we could co-locate in areas where the council has like the emergency center for things when you have floods or fires and communities don't have power that the battery could then actually start providing power to that building where people could communicate, where they could get their food, where they could come together, charge phones, make calls to relatives, et cetera. So another thing to consider is, you know, from our perspective, we'd, we'd like to work with councils to co-locate that in those types of facilities, uh, which is a great thing for the community. Thanks, Peter. Oh, yes. Um, and as part of that process, it actually replaces the diesel generators that are on site there as well. So yeah, it's another good green outcome. Yeah, look, uh, part of what local buy is working towards for next year for the panel is to, to, to help um, in those situations. So, you know, the, bat the battery backup, no matter what your source of power is, is going to be very important. Um, whether, whether we're on green energy of various types or whether we're off the grid or working from the grid, sorry. Um, the need for that battery backup is is very strong. And, you know, as the new, newer vehicles start arriving in the market that have got um, vehicle back to back to the grid or, or vehicle to your load, which is, you know, where you can plug your own house in or things like that, um, they're going to be very important because your vehicle will become a, a mobile battery source and energy source in the future. Just to potentially jump in there as well, Shane, and maybe just talk about the situation on, you know, a, a little bit larger. I think that, that Peter and Mike will probably agree with this sentiment as well, is that being in this space, we're often met with a lot of resistance, um, just even to the, the, the idea or the conversation. And it, that's partially due to the reason that because what we have today doesn't necessarily align with the exact future state that, you know, most people believe is the perfect scenario, which is, you know, potentially 10, 10 plus years away. And I think it's always important to remember a little bit of like context here. And if we think back, you know, a little while into our past, and that was with the light bulb that was invented by candlelight. But just because they had candlelight, it didn't prevent them from trying to get some new technology that would, you know, improve everybody's quality of life. And that's what we're doing here. Just because the solution we have at the moment may not be perfect. Maybe we do have battery storage, which even has a, you know, a diesel generator or is powered from the grid and not renewables, it's not necessarily a reason not to explore it now. It's not worse than what we're currently doing. It may not provide the full, full impact or the full benefit, but if we put our um, you know, energy and effort and our funds and we vote with our dollars in creating this infrastructure, we will see that you know, greener, more sustainable, more renewable economy here a lot sooner than we think. I agree with you, James. Um, yeah, when you think of just where the Queensland Energy Plan is heading, you know, and the federally, you know, heading to 80, 85 percent um, renewables, I mean that that in a very short period of time is a massive change for industry. And having the EV charges out there and things like we were talking about before, um, all that means is, you know, we're just going to get there faster, just going to accelerate that process. And you know, whilst maybe you know, only 20 or 40% of that energy might be green today, getting to 80 is going to happen very quickly. And so I don't think we need to really worry about that side of the coin here. Um, the, what my main concern is, can we actually be ready ahead of the curve for the adoption of EVs that's coming? And the two key points I want to make on that is, you know, I, I used to work in the distribution utilities when solar PV uh, was first being discussed. And you know, we did some forecasts about what we thought the uptake of PV were, you know, using all the well-informed brains that we had around the country. And everybody was wrong by about a factor of 10 or 100. Um, and the reason was is because customers saw this as advantageous for them. Customers saw this as saving them money and they just went and did it. Uh, and they didn't have to worry about it. The, they just went and did it whether the utility liked it or not. And what I'm seeing in uh, surveys that are being done with customers at the moment is households, uh, I believe, are going to adopt EVs much more quickly than PV. And so if you think about what that actually means, you go, how do I get ahead of the curve to actually make sure this infrastructure is out there 
Um, knowing that the green stuff is happening in the background through the state energy plan and the federal plan, the green components are actually happening, but how do I get the EV charging out there to meet the volumes that are coming along? And, I, and you know, where the energy industry was with solar PV, they, I, I'd have to say, you know, they probably weren't that proactive at, at the start. They just sort of let this thing happen. And now it's become a really big problem for them about how they do it and how they manage. And in fact, some states are saying, now I'm going to turn off solar at different times of the day. Um, can you imagine telling everyone, oh, sorry, you can't charge your car? Uh, that, that's probably an even worse situation. So I think the harder problem is how do we get the infrastructure out there ahead of the curve? What do you think, James or Mike? Uh, I, just to, to respond to that, like, exactly. I think that we're, we're both saying the exact same thing. It's that you shouldn't wait to plan. You shouldn't wait to be proactive and, and you should start going out there and, and making those changes and, um, I, I guess, scoping that landscape right now. And I totally agree. Yeah, and that's what you mentioned the energy plan is going to do to make sure we've got the capability to support the electrification of the transport uh, fleet into the future. Uh, and, and just to add on to what James was saying, you know, even if we have greater fuel efficiency standards right up front, that's an immediate across the fleet reduction in emissions, not the ideal outcome, but, you know, there is um, advantageous of that because these ICE vehicles are going to be on the roads for, for a number of years to come. So, yeah, hopefully the feds can get on board with uh, some greater policy decisions in relation to fuel standards. Yeah. Um, I think that the best thing, though, when I look at, from what the councils do. Councils are in the middle and have probably the best relationship with communities than a lot of other types of companies. You have big reach and you've got the ability to, you know, grow a social license and set the right standards. And, and what I see is typically um, councils actually leading the way in many parts on, um, on the green agenda and, you know, having greener communities, more trees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of things councils are doing. So, this in a way just helps you extend your social license and grow it even more.